Welcome to Top Lines and Tales. On this week's podcast, we continue our legendary Cattleman series with a man who has been constantly described by many as the most supreme stockman, not only of his generation, but possibly of all time, the great Dave Smith. Firstly, we'll hear a few words from one of his peers of the time, Bert Rugg, telling us about Dave's beginnings. He worked for Randmuir, was the name of the farm. Dave was there. He brought out a bloody good bull for them. And I suppose it was there he left to go and drive a lorry. Did he? Uh -huh. And West Drummers was advertising for a stockman. Now it was Perth Show. After you'd uh, been there? Oh, oh, aye, oh, aye, oh, aye, oh, long, oh, a good well, few years, five yeah. or six years after uh -huh. I'd been there. And he met my wife. He says, now, I see West Drummers advertising for a stockman. I was wanting to see Bert, mm -hmm. whether I should try for it. Was um, Rankin still there? Aye, aye. All right. And uh, she said to him, he was just telling you to go and start the job, Dave. So the next thing we had, he got the job. No, he was at West Drums, I would say, bloody near 20 years. I mean, and he was championing the hill way, I. I think somebody once said he's 17 champions at the hill. Over the years, Dave Smith will have had many friends, both within and out with the industry, but none much closer than Dave Murray from Forfa. Dave, welcome to the podcast. Hi, good, Andy, yes. And uh, Dave, when did you first meet Smithy? Well, I had known of him from the mid to late 60s. And then he got back to West Drums in 1969. And he got married there. He started producing on tremendous string of the bulls who went from in 1971. He had 12 at first. Six of them were first in the class and uh, overall champion and they were just outstanding. And after that, um, I used to go and visit him a lot at West Drums and we got married and stayed two miles from him. And we had children at the same time and we just were so friendly. It was great. So, so you were you were close pals, and, and and he had such a natural ability with stock, though, didn't he, Dave? And he never used a show stick. He was quite an extraordinary man amongst amongst cattle. Ah, he didn't believe in show sticks at all, uh, or the jewels in the nose. He didn't like them, especially with females. Anyway, he just loved to show them natural, and he he, had a, he just had a fantastic knack of breaking a beast and showing it the. I know you're coming on to this with the cow he won the Royal Highland with in 81 or 82. She, he broke her with a halter when she was six years old after he bought her. He's never had a halter on her head, which is quite amazing. <laughs> Indeed. And, and, and he wasn't one to mess with the beasts at the show. All this work could get done at home, wouldn't he? So when he got to the show, he could enjoy himself. There's no question of that. He, he was meticulous at home. Everything was done to perfection at home and he knew when they went to the Highland or the bull sales that he could just leave them in peace for a, a day at least, let them settle and then go and have a dram as we all know Dave liked his dram. Money the dram I've had with him on it, so sure. <laughs> <laughs> and going back to West Drums, he'd have learnt a lot from Jerry Rankin at West Drums about pedigrees and about life in general I think and when he took the job on I believe that uh, Rankin said, now Dave, I don't want you talking about me behind my back. And he replied, if I'm going to talk about you, I'll do it to your face. <laughs> that was the measure of him, I think. That's, he, t he called a spade a spade. That's just exactly Smith all. He, he actually worked with Jerry Rankin in the mid-60s at Craig Easy, where Lady Glendine ended up. Oh, as, as a young boy, he was in the Bothy there for a year or two, and I don't know, the part of company there, and he ended up driving a lorry at the Backwater Dam up the back of Lentrethen here, and uh, Jerry went up and got him. I'm wanting you at West Drums. You can get out of that lorry and get down with me. So they had a fantastic arrangement. They, they would have their fallouts, but they just respected one another so much that the thing worked fantastically well. Yeah. Uh, and you mentioned the six bulls in, in 1971 from West Drums that, uh, that were all won their class and an unrivaled feat, I think. Um, but a lot of those bulls, would he be his, they'd be his breeding by then. Well, He'd have been there uh, a couple of years. To be fair, he's, a couple of years, it was off a bull called Erica Thornton. And to be fair, there's only one, as Dave always said, there's only one other man had done it. It was uh, Albert Retty, Richard Retty's grandfather. 
and he did it in 1966, and that was the, he was Dave's hero, Albert Ray. Dave Albert Albert Ray. And funnily enough, this, if you remember the old Perth market, they bulls for Albert Ray and Osmonds came out at exactly the same stall as Dave's bulls were in. It was quite incredible. Five years later, Dave came out with exactly the same sort of scenario. Uh, what, what a what a great feat to follow one of your heroes. And I, I've been speaking to Jim oh. Donald, um, and once again, Jim Donald said that Albert Retty was his hero. Yes, some man. Fantastic family. Indeed. Uh, when Dave was at uh, West mm-hmm. Drums, uh, uh, he worked with a bull called Evesons of Duplin. Do you remember him? I remember him very well. He bought him, I, in the 76, 77, maybe. And he was so different then. Everything was still quite thick and nearer the ground. And this big raw calf came in to Dublin and he just looked different, you know. Mm. He was just so different at the time and uh, Gordon Aiken brought him out well. But he was obviously still growing and Dave, they decided this is the way we've got to go. We have to get them a bit bigger and, and a bit more growth rate in the bottom for 3,800. And then <laughs> Dave won the Highland Show maybe twice with him, I think. He did. He won the Highland Show in 78 and 79, and then I think he sold him to Ashley, and they won it again with him. The, the bull had some record. I actually bought him at the dispersal. And, and there's, I, I gather there's still semen being used off that bull today. The, the, um, uh, Jordy Souter said he's one of the, the last of the good Scottish cattle. Aye, well, that's for sure. He, he, I mean, nowadays he maybe wouldn't be as big as he looked then, but uh, he was still a good, very good cattle beast. And then when when Westrum's dispersed, uh, Dave um, Smithy had already had a job lined up with Jim Love. What was Jim Love like? He was an ex prize fighter, wasn't he? Aye, that uh, <clears throat> I felt so. I thought I felt oh, sorry for Dave. We Westrum's packing up. It was the end of an era. These type of herds owned by multinational companies or car groups or whatever. That was kind of the last one. Boots, the drug drug company selling up and. Dave had to start again, and he, he had the determination and the ability, to, a big shift away down to Ayrshire, to a different kind of people, different kind of everything down there, you know, it wasn't the best of land or anything, but by gosh, he was determined. And Jim Love gave him uh, um, some leeway to buy the cattle, and he bought five from the West Drums Dispersal, I think, and then a, another seven more from Newhouse, uh, a lot of Edwinas amongst them. Oh, I Dave built the herd up for nothing. Aye, he did that. He loved the Edwinas. I went to New House to see them before the sale, and and they, oh, what a grand show of cows they were. I mean, there were the faces on them. The, these lovely Edwina heads that Dave really loved and showed for years after. Every right. place he went, he rebuilt the herd. And, and the years after, you're right with the New House Edwina, the the 112th. That was some beast, and she won the Highland twice in '83 and '84. Again, you know, some 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 feat to win it twice with the same beast. <clears throat> I know I've got a wee bit about her. Dave showed her the first year. I don't, he'll no mind me telling this story now. Yeah. Aye, she had a bit of white on her udder. Just Dave thought in the show ring, it just maybe much enough white. So he got in a wee spray tin of black paint and <laughs> sprayed a wee bit of the white out. So it didn't look so obvious. So the next year when he took her back, he thought, damn it, I'll hate to try and remember where I sprayed her. <laughs> so she didn't look different to last year. <laughs> but she won again anyway. So. Oh, he was a man. I, I've asked a question to a few people about the steer uh, that Scott Watson won London with the uh, Panda of West Drums as to why he was called Panda, because Panda to me denotes there might be a white patch on there, but nobody's ever owned up to that one, so I'm not sure if that's true or not. No, I I, I was there. I remember the calf very well. Dave Dave took me to the first winter fair at Edinburgh. I had a couple of beasts, and he had a couple, and we went down in the West Rums float, and this calf was in it, and he was actually a pedigree calf. And his name, he'd be a pride family, and he was called Panda West Rums, so it was just the name they'd given him. He was obviously castrated, and I remember there was a bit stushy at Edinburgh because they couldn't get his testicles checked but in the stall at that time because he was jumping about a bit. And of course, Dave, being Dave, was in the bar. So I went up, I said, I'll go up and get him. So I got up and I says to Dave, there's, there's needn't to check the testicles of your stoat. Well, they'll no find anything because they're lying in the field at West Drums. <laughs> <laughs> Another man who was also close by Smithy is Norman Taylor. Welcome to the podcast, Norman, or should I call you Stormin? Well, whatever, Andy, whatever title suits. 
Thanks very much for having me. <laughs> and and Norman, you, when did you first uh, when did you first meet Smithy? What was your involvement with him? Well, um, I would reckon it would be around about 1979, 80. Um, I think um, we met um, at Drimmon Show. I was helping uh, the legendary Jimmy Martin from Fraser Stock Ranches showing cattle. And then on the Sunday, the Young Farmers Club had an outing. Um, we had an exchange weekend and we had an outing on the Maid of the Loch. Um, the boat that sails, the steam that sails up Loch Lomond mm -hmm. and lo and behold there was Jimmy uh, Jimmy McMillan, Jimmy Martin, um, uh, Ian and Madge, uh, Dave and Freed and all the young farmers and we entered the bar as the boat cast off and we exited the bar six hours later um, when the boat docked and we had a whale of a time and <laughs> In the conversation, I had said, you know, I had never been to the Highland Show, showing cattle, and Smithy said, well, you're coming with me this year. And that was my first introduction to Dave Smith. Brilliant. Brilliant. And, and, and yes, I know you followed him through uh, um, the, the the wins that uh, we've just discussed with uh, with uh, Dave Murray there, but you, you were in on that unrivaled achievement in 1985. So, uh, Bert Rugg mentioned to me how, how it was pointed out that Smithy never went near the, the four cattle that he had at the show for, for the whole of the time, first two or three days he was there. He spent the time in the bar, and I think Bert and one or two mm. others were a little bit disgruntled by that. Um, and, uh, he, yes, he was still at Shield Mains at the time, but... Seemingly, you guys, or, or, yeah. or between you, you had a team, a crew of guys who would just go and feed the cattle, and 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 Davy knew he didn't need to go near them. Well, I mean, uh, that was exactly right. I mean, we we were doing the legwork, um, but it was all part of the learning process, and you know, you were learning off of somebody of Dave's stature. Um, but there was another situation where we went to bed late, early one morning, and the last thing Smithy had said was make sure these are up and fed the cattle. So Big Buff and I, up at five o'clock, fed the cattle, back to the caravan, back into our bed. The alarm clock of Smithy's alarm clock went off. He got up, cursing and swearing. He was actually a very good English teacher. Um, and it's a little known fact about Dave. Uh, he had a fantastic grasp of the English language. Um, so he came back to the caravan using more nouns, verbs, and adjectives than I've ever heard in one sentence, um, stating that somebody had stole the feeding, and he couldn't believe this. He says, but the cattle looked quite contented. Uh, unbeknown to him, we'd been up, fed the cattle, and went back to our bed. Uh, I can still see him yet coming into the caravan, raging, raging. That somebody had the audacity to steal the feeding. Them. As I say, you know the, uh, the adjectives and verbs and nouns that were used in one sentence were fantastic. He could certainly use some swear words. I think we all know that. Uh, Dave, I go back to you. You were on that team as well, I believe, uh, um, uh, that year. And it was a, uh, for the record, I think it was Shield Mains Ed Weiner. Out of one of the new house Edwinas that won the supreme champion that day, but it wasn't just the supreme champion; it was it was the whole shooting match. Is that right? Oh, it was incredible. We just actually cleaned up everything. He champion male, champ, reserve male, female, reserve female, and every prize. Well, all the championships, all the group prizes. And I remember after we were putting the board up, we got from the society to put your tickets on because we were champion. And with 32 prize tickets, and every one was a winner. There was none of them was a second. Well, they were all first prizes and all champions. You know, it was just amazing. Fantastic. And we'd never been in our bed because Dave said we'll have an early night because we started early in the morning. And then Ian Roberts appeared with a ghetto blaster thing with us telling stories. <laughs> if I remember, it was Peter Cook and Dudley Moore, and it was it was the funniest exactly. thing ever. And we sat there, and the next thing, it was daylight, and we had to go and work. <laughs> and we never were in our bed, and I was standing in, I remember him to parade the old stock bull, because he was, Dave got me to show him the Thornton bull, because he was a bit doer-headed, and he says, you'll get his head up, you're a big lad. So now I went out in the parade in the afternoon, and I was just about lying down on the grass, trying to get asleep. <laughs> You've been eating it, but then, Dave. Dave, you showed the bull, I think, for you took the bull out 
Is that right in his class? I would. Do, I, I showed the Thornton Bulls of Dave, and we were first. I won the class, and then I was male champion. And a son of his was a yearling bull was reserve male champion. And then Dave showed the heifer, and she was female champion. And I think Johnny McMillney got him to show the cow. I think she was the mother of the heifer. She was not. She was out of hundred. And we're all the same Edwina family, kid. Okay? She was Newhouse Edwina one two nine, and she was a daughter of Edwina one hundred and twelfth, I believe. Yeah. Mm-hmm. It was all the mm-hmm. same family, and they were just at that time they were beautiful cattle. Yeah? Yep. And uh, Smithy had the, the the skins just like silk. Mm-hmm. But we took them around to wash bed that morning because they were totally covered in dust and stew. They hadn't had a hose or nothing. And Dave, now don't put a brush near them, just a sponge and the, the hose and the soft water on them. And they came back, and there was a mash ready for them, a wee bit of water in it, and you just saw these cattle appearing from nowhere. Yeah? It just it was absolutely amazing. Old Willie McGowan from Fife, the shorthorn guy, he was sitting on a bale, and I remember him saying after, I've never seen anything like that. The cattle's been neglected <laughs> practically all week. <laughs> neglected. <laughs> Suddenly they're just all appearing in absolute beautiful bloom, and they just walked out. And, and they deserved to win. They were so, good. They were so well-matched and a right type Angus cattle, you know, good legs and heads and that on them. It's amazing what a good pail of beet pulp can do. You know, if you look back at the record, Andy, I'm sure that was the third day of the show they cut all the show, and the show was all different at that time. There was a weekend first, and the Argus people huh? were showing for about the third day of the show. That's right. And then at nine o'clock in the morning, and then I said to my wife, I wasn't along married at the time, oh, I'll be him after that, you see. So, of course, Dave, you'll have to stay until tomorrow. He's in the team, the bull. You have to show him. You have. So I had to try and get a phone, which was about impossible at that time. Mm-hmm. Now, I think I ended up getting a mobile fee, you know, the original mobiles from Bertie Payton. And I phoned Palm, and it was kind of silence on the other end of the phone. <laughs> I won't be home till tomorrow. <laughs> but anyway, I showed them the next day. I can't remember who we were on in the, in the teams of four, to be honest with you. I honestly can't remember. I think that was the year George Muttleth won the overall with the Roman Gola. I think. Ro- Roman Gola. Mm. Uh, I think he was jumping overall with Roman Gola that day. Dave's heifer was maybe second or third in the lineup. The uh, longest heifer. Uh, Dave, I believe Smithy and Jim Love eventually fell out. Is that right? Aye, it was never a marriage made in heaven. Not he was a coal miner kind of lad and a bit ruthless. And Dave would stand up for himself, and he didn't like that. He liked these men to be just tow to him and. I think mm. it, it, it all turned nasty. It was an awful sad. It was really sad. Because David had done so much for the guy. He gave him incredible success in a short time. I was, I was come to a farm, really, a place that wasn't very good at all. But uh, anyway, as Dave always said, when one door closes, another one opens. And that's exactly and that. That's... Were the Shieldmen's cattle dispersed? Because obviously when big Alan McKay came in and snapped up... Um... Smith, he, he started with the same lines of cattle again. Did he? Did, was there a dispersal sale that he bought those at? He had a job. I think Dave, when he left under six bad circumstances, the, the cows were just kind of neglected. And there was a sale, but I think it was the market that did it. I think some lads doing in that corner had been in and picked the best ones before that. There was another good heifer at Monkwood, wasn't there? There was Great. a coup yeah. at Monkwood, and there were seen or two other ends that were sold maybe privately, and then the, the rest were just sold in Stirling Ayrshire Market, I think it was. But now you still had the pedigrees, obviously, so uh-huh. I think Dave got somebody to buy one or two there. Norman, tell me about big uh, Alan McKeg, then. He was another another one of life's characters. Yeah. Uh, made his money in oh. mining, is that right? Yeah, I yeah. So I think they were a kind of um, a third generation mining quarrying family um, from I think uh, the fourth direction in Lanarkshire, um, if I remember correctly. Um, so he established um, the Canvas Barn herd at Woodside at Canvas Barn, quite near where I stay now. Um, kind of Angus um, and Highland cattle, and well, towards the end, uh, Charlies as well. Some decent Charolais. What, what did Smithy make of the Charolais? He was never a big fan, was he? He hated getting covered in soap and powder and all the rest of it, you know. And the, I can remember he, he said to me one night, he said, listen, he said, uh, you don't like this black, you know, soap and all the rest. He says, anyway, I've bought a, a Charlie Bull. He says, and you're going to show it. He says, and you can cover yourself in powder and soap up to your heart's content. So he bought, he bought uh, a bull 
from a uh, German Moira McConaughey uh, called Andre Fred, and we had a lot of a lot of success around the local shows. In fact, uh, Drummond Show one year, Smithy and I were uh, vying it out for the championship, and the Shadley got it, and I had a Smithy. I never heard the end of it for <laughs> weeks. <laughs> The, the 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 judge Alan Turner. Um, I used to do a milk run with uh, Alan's brother, so I don't know if that was a persuasion or not. But um, he he gave me the championship ticket that, that year in front of Dave. I wouldn't go down too well. Brave man. <laughs> a brave man. You're right. <laughs> and then um, so with Canvas Baron, then again, obviously Dave went to two successive Highland shows. For the second time, and in, in this time in 1991 and 1992, with the same bull that you mentioned, That's early, yeah. early Sunset Coalition. So let's talk about the Canadian bull, Early Sunset Coalition. He was a huge brute, wasn't he? I think I read somewhere he was 1,550 kilos when he won the Highland. Is that right? When you when you look back and see the scale and and and, and size that that bull was at that time, you know, even that was early 90s. You know, it was amazing, amazing. And, you know, had great success at the Highland, Yorkshire, the Royal Show with him. And he was shared with Tom Adam, is that right, at Greenyards? Yes. Oh, yep. You know, I'll, I'll tell you a very funny story. Um, we were in the, uh, the caravan park. Um, now, the environmental health people would close the caravan down, so in the caravan was Smithy, uh, big buff Bill Rowan from Air. Bob McMalter and myself, and um, Smithy was cleaning his dentures out of a cup with a toothbrush, and, and there was a chap at the door, and here was Alan McCaig with the Canadian uh, person who sold the bull and his wife, and Alan had suggested that we offer them some hospitality, so kettle was boiled, and the tooth, the, the mug where Dave was cleaning his dentures, was tipped down the sink and the coffee was given to the Canadian chap who kind of stated that it tasted a bit pepperminty. <laughs> and Smithy says, that's correct. He says, it's peppermint coffee. He says, and it's also very good for cleaning your teeth. <laughs> so, very fun. <laughs> And I think um, I'm right in thinking that he won the interbreed at the Highland in 1991. Would I be right, uh, Norman? That's correct, uh, 1991. Yeah. And, um, and he went on to win. He went on to win male champion at the Royal for, for both those same years. But he was beaten by by a heifer both times. I think one time his own heifer, a Prussian Pollard heifer, and he won the Yorkshire as well. I think. Yes, he won the Yorkshire as well. Yep, he did. And then I believe he came back to the Royal in 1993 and he won reserve mail again. So uh, it's, it's a massive record for one animal. Yeah, 1993. You're exactly right. Yep. Uh, Norman, we've had many discussions on this podcast about the Royal Smithfield show. And again, when he turned his hand to it, he was a hard man to beat. Didn't he win uh, all three steer classes and then the Duke of Norfolk all on his own in uh, in 1991? Is that right? 1991, uh, we were reserve in the Duke of Norfolk. Um, I think in one of the earlier podcasts, Gillian Owen um, alluded to the fact that the Shadleys won. We were reserved to the Shadleys with three animals bred by the same exhibitor. Um, and I'll, tell you, I'll tell you a very funny story uh, very quickly. about. So we were presented, both reserve and champion in reserve were presented to her Majesty the Queen Mother and the red carpet and the entourage was making its way forward and she introduced we were introduced to so the team were David Dave Smith, David Clark and myself. And she moved to Dave at the end and started speaking at some length, you know, where you were from. I think Dave had met her previously um, and she knew exactly where Canvas Barn was. Uh, um, I think she had opened the, the, the new Stirling Royal Infirmary, as it was at the time, during the summer. Uh, so she knew geographically where we were from, blah, blah, blah. And there was a, a five-minute discussion. And after she moved on on the red carpet, the 
the reporters and photographers were allowed in. And this young scribe, I think from the Fulham, Chelsea and Fulham Echo, uh, very enthusiastic, came up and asked Dave, you know, what was she talking about? And do you mind me asking? And Dave, without flinching, gave this uh, long-winded story about how he'd known her for many years and that uh, the last time he was at her house, um, what a party they had. And in fact, she was just inviting me back there um, towards the end of this week, if I could manage. Um, so this guy's writing this down in shorthand. When Sir Ian Grant, Jim Stobo and a young Donald Bigger came forward and said to the young scribe, whatever that guy and these guys have told you, please rip it out that pad and do not publish any of it because it's nonsense. But as I said, you know, his sense of humor, Smithy's sense of humor in the moment was second to none. Brilliant. Yeah. Brilliant. And that's around about the time that I got to know him in the early 90s. And he was always kind to me and, and uh, as, as a youngster. And he had time for everybody, especially at Smithford. He had time for everybody. And, and I think you know, a lot of people appreciated that. A, fanta a fantastic teacher. Um, as I say, I remember going to Shield Mains. I was keen to learn how to clip cattle. And um, he had five or six young heifers tied up. And and it's lodged in my memory because I got booted up and down. I got a scheme booting from most of them. Um, but he said that that was all part of the learning process of learning how to clip. He's you quite know? right. He, He's quite right. He, he, absolutely. But he was so encouraging. So encouraging. And I say he got on with everybody. It probably wasn't everybody. I once saw him take his coat off to Big John Redpath in the Rank Village Bar there. He, he had some temper on him when he got going. Oh, I, there was a... An incident the Old Stocksman Bar at the Highland Show many, many years ago. Um, well before the show started, so maybe the f first night. And Dave Smith Sr. and Smithy and myself and Ronnie Wiley we were all standing outside. And there was this big chap from the west coast of Scotland causing a bit of a commotion. Anyway, the one and only time I can remember Smithy going to the bar to actually buy drink Buying the drink was not a problem with Smithy, but it was getting him to go to the bar. Anyway, he come back and he was all dressed up with his blazer and shirt and tie, and this big guy bumped into him. And old Dave Senior says to me, "Well, here we go now." Smithy took off the blazer, handed over the drinks to his, his, his father in a tray, tapped the big guy on the shoulder, and stroked this guy and laid him flat out. <laughs> Oh, it was to be to be seen, to be admired. <laughs> oh, absolutely! And the police, Julia, appeared and uh, asked who it was that hit the guy, and said, "Thanks very much. You've done us a favour. He's been causing havoc throughout the show all night." Excellent. You know? And then um, Dave, moving on, then uh, uh, Dave uh, Smithy moved to Cardona for Ian Galloway of Scott Beef. Um, Dave, and uh, didn't they surprise everyone at the Canvas Baron dispersal by uh, turning up and buying all the cattle? Nobody even knew who was buying them. Aye, it was a fantastic sale that day. I was my son. I got my son and Dave offered him a job to help with the sale for a fortnight beforehand, and he was only 16, but what an education he got. <laughs> Two nights in the Waverley Hotel, and then the sale day was just ama amazing. The team, the, the herd of cattle Smithy had built there at Canvas Barn was tremendous. And then Galloway got stuck in about them. I, I didn't actually know. They had a herd before. I, I don't know whether they still had a few in their share, but they really were going at it big time and were wanting Smithy, obviously, to go home and, and work for them. And it was a, it was an amazing day. It was one of these dispersals that poor Dave, every time you make a good job of something, it gets sold. And that's the problem. But uh, it's he, another door opened, as Dave said, and it kept on. It was another door open, and he really performed the goods there as well like but he, he built a dynasty of, of of females didn't he through through now into his fourth herd and uh didn't take him very long before he's he's back at the top again 
Aye, the Edwinas and the Precious Pollocks, he just, uh, he just, mm. he's just a master at bringing out the show call. Absolute master. Bert Rugger <laughs> told me a tale about uh, how Dave got to buy Mushroom Friar Fergus, which I'll play you the clip now. And well, I get the credit of telling them to go and look at him. He was there watching the, the paneling, when uh -huh. they paneled him. So he says, Christ, he says, looking for a stoke ball here, he says, it's hellish. And I had seen <coughs> Friar Fergus just a uh -huh. forty weeks before on bare feet for her, but it was an old coup that she was in and, and I said to her, I'd like you come down and see this bull. No, true or untrue, she said, well, told the butcher him. Oh I says, I says to her, if Dave Smith got his hands in this bloody bull, he'd win the hill. <laughs> so I tell them to go and look at him. No, on the Sunday night, he come up the passage. Oh well, he says, you're in for it now. Walked the ball. He says, Ruby and me went to see him. And he says, you're right enough. He says, I said to the lad that was looking after him, could you come out and give him a walk for us? And what he was walking on was wee stains again. He says, he just walked like a clay still. Uh, and... Dave, tell me a bit about him. He was just a big lump of fleshy bull. He was a real meaty animal, and I think he was three years old when Bert Rugg said to him at Perth, there's no much here, he's bought the bull, and Dave was raving about this bull when he came back. And I thought, well, if Dave's raving about him, he must be good. <laughs> and then he won, I don't remember how many shows he won with him as well. Did he win the Highland as well? He did win the Highland, and he won the Burke at the Royal as well, I think. No, uh, uh, he... he was a, just a right good fleshy bull with plenty of scouth about him in size and flesh. I think he came back at the, to the Highland the following year and won it again, and by then he'd be yeah, he'd be getting on, he'd be a five or six year old. Mm -hmm. Aye, aye. Was, aye. That, was that in 1995? I think he won the Highland in 95 and 96. Because I remember 1995 at the Royal Show, we were champion in reserve. So in 1995, Mushroom uh, Friar Fergus was male champion, but uh, he got beaten for the championship by um, by Monkwood, um, but the following year he came back in 1996 and he did win the Highland uh, that year. And Norman, as you say, he won. Uh, he went on and won the Burke uh, at the Royal, and I think he may have won the Royal mm. twice. Uh, and Smithy won the Royal in 1998 with a heifer, a Fiona heifer, out of a Netherton cow, and then he went and won the Royal again in 1999 with a. Cambrus Baron cow that uh, that he'd bred a long time earlier, and she was six year old. Uh, Smithy jumped judged to Highland in '94, maybe to give everybody else a break. Were you guys there at, uh, and, and saw what he did? Did he do a good job? Dave, oh, I, I, I think the, I remember the cow class. There was sixteen in it, and there was one old guy that was always there criticising, and he came over to Dave after it was our boy, and he says, "Oh, that cool you had second six should have been first, and that should have been this and that." And I just dumped the guy. I'll no mention any names. And I just says, look, I said, what is your opinion? I'd ask you to judge. <laughs> and Dave says, thanks, Biggie. Thanks, Biggie. Got me a hole there. <laughs> and I think he gave the champion that year to a great big Canadian bull from, from Alistair Wiley and Monkwood. I don't, I don't think Smithy judged Perth, did, did he? He did an October sale a few years ago now. He had a very disappointing show at the judge. It was the October sale and it was never very strong. He had a hell of a good ball in the last class for Neil Massey. But he says, I was so glad to see that one because there wasn't much else to pick from. Yeah. No but I can't remember how long ago is that now. Oh, that's a, that's a lot of years ago, Dave. Aye, that's a lot of years, years ago. ago. And, and Dave, you judged Perth in 1991, is that right? <clears throat> I did it in 91, the Languses, and I did it in 2002, I think it was. Or 2001, no, 2001 as well, just before the foot and mouth. I did it twice, aye. And I did the March sale, which you'll never remember, oh. There used to be a supplementary sale in March, which Dave Smith had won with his first ever bull, like Bert Rugg told you that, before yeah. Neth. Yeah. Dave was yeah. 15 when he brought that out. Really? And I actually judged the very last one that kind of fizzled out, that one. And I judged the May sale as well, so. Yeah. And a bit of fun, you know, a couple of Charlies as well, so October and February with the Charlies. Dave had a bit of success with the Charlies himself. Um, you know, Canvas Barn Fee, for example. Um, Aye. You know, the legendary Canvas Barn Fee. 
bought by John and Andrew Hornell from Fallen Inch, and mm -hmm. you know, she went on to win Interbreed after Interbreed, you know, and in fact, I think that was in the 2001, so that would be in the foot and mouth year. Um, mm -hmm. I think the Scottish right. farmers run a run a virtual, you know, show kind of type of thing. And I think she was voted best interbreed winner of all time by the readers in the Scottish mm -hmm. farmers. So, you know, there was a lot of the canvas barn breeding there. Aye. Up the new house at Clams, they bought the coos for you, I think, originally. That's correct, right. Mm -hmm. yep. uh, I remember him having a... He, uh, I'm sorry, I think only once in my life I was quite proud that I could give Dave a bit of advice, because he was usually giving me advice. Uh -huh. And it was just a sit home having Charlie's, and he does good calf that you ended up reserved junior wee at Perth. And he phoned me and said, I can't get this. Charlie, eat enough, Dave. You can't hoot to feed Charlie's. You, he's not eating enough. I said, is he weaned? No, no, he's only seven months. I said, well, get him weaned and get yeah. him on to the hard feeding. <laughs> no, he's too young. I said, he's nothing of the kind. And weaned him. And the ball throwed like a mushroom after that. And yeah, he thanked me for that. <laughs> so Aye. it was the one time in my life I was able to give him a wee bit of advice. Excellent. And then he got reserved junior with that bull. And I always remember the morning of the sale, Dave had been there all week with Angus's and this was the last day and he was looking a bit bedraggled and he was leaning on his fork, uh, smoking a fag. And Albert Conley, the Irish guy, oh, yeah. he was a great uh -huh. Charlie man, uh -huh. he appeared and he just, well he was there before me, he was dressed with a suit and tie and everything on and he says to Dave, you have to get your bull soaked up Dave, you get your bull soaked up. Well, I reckon I'm no often good at that. And here's Albert with a bra three piece suit on and a tie, soap and smithy's bull. <laughs> and Smithy's standing leaning on his fork, smoking a fag. <laughs> oh, uh, uh, that was about the measure of Heard a story uh, uh, the bull that he sold from Canvas Baron to Ireland and uh and it went on uh, to win Balmoral, and and um, Smithy went back over to Balmoral to, uh, to to take a look at it. Um, any either of you guys? I was I, with I, him. I... Yeah, well, so um, Camus Barn Proud Punch uh, uh, was the bull, uh, and a sister to Precious Paula, um, Victor Wallace, and a syndicate from Ireland bought the bull, and it would be you know getting back into the five figure bulls. He was 10,000 because I joined 10, 000, that day. That's yeah. right. Yeah. Yep. He was I made him a reserve champion because he didn't have enough end to boot him for me that day. That's he had a tremendous yeah. head on him. So we we were invited across to the Balmoral show. Yeah. and yeah, I mean, this is just a simple story, but um, Smithy walked into the... It was a buyer structure where the, the cattle were held at the King's Hall. And Smithy, with his voice, said, Punch! And this bull got up out of the stall and looked right round at him, as if he'd never missed him, you know. Uh, as if, oh, there's my man, there's my master. Victor Wallace told me that as Luck Penny, um, Dave sent him a collie dog, a collie pup, and he said, uh, Wallace said it was the, oh, best, right? the cleverest Victor, dog he'd ever had, he said. <laughs> well, am I allowed to say, Andy, with it, you know, it was at Air Show, I, the first time I'd ever been at Air Show, I went down with Dave and I think Jimmy McMullen and people were there. And it was the bull he he was a reserve champion for boots with him. He was a son of Eve's son. But he was, uh -huh. a, bit, he was a big growthy lad, but no, just enough behind him and things. And that was Ian bought him, and Ian and him had had a bit of turwar that day, and that's what he said. He says, I bred the bastard, I fed the bastard, I sell the bastard, and he's still a bastard. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I don't know who told me this. That uh, I think I'm right in saying that Smithy had 17 champions at the Highland show in something like five different breeds, would that be right? Aye, I think there was someone, definitely something like that. He won with Lincoln Reds, Galloways, Simmentals, Roman Golas, Sabatina. Roman oh Golas, aye. Aye, just, he could produce anything and make it look the part, you know. Just made it look The, the Roman Nola story. Go on. Um, I remember Andrew and John Hornell had, and Matt, Jordy McElwraith, you know, all these guys, had their cattle looking magnificent. Smithy had a Roe McNola bull when he was at Boots, and it was caked and shite. Never been ignored. It was away round the corner from the Aberdeen Angus, so nobody was near it. Came back round, morning of the show, couldn't wet it because they were using Shadley soap on it. It came out with a tinge of khaki, was what it looked like. Um, but went on to be junior champion and beat Andrew Hornell, and he wasn't the best pleased. Let me tell you, you know, 
Uh, Norman, after he was diagnosed with cancer, it, uh, it slowed him down a wee bit, but he still battled on for a, you know, a number of years with the... Uh, Oh, he, he did magnificent. Um, you know, many a person in that position wouldn't have been able to cope. Uh, but Smithy soldiered on. You know, we had a kind of personal interest. Uh, my wife nursed uh, Dave um, as part of his recovery after his uh, laryngectomy. Um, but you know, a lot of a lot of fantastic, uh, funny stories again. You know, with Dave, hands covered in shit and. You know, he had a, a speaking valve, and sometimes you couldn't put the finger up because it was, you know, to cover the valve you needed to enable him to speak. But so he was left speechless, and we all used to take the mickey out of him. And, uh, uh, but uh, yeah, I mean, he he went on despite having that illness, um, uh, and got back to full time work. Uh, really amazing, Dave. Yeah, it's just amazing. He, uh, when he, Ian Anderson went to visit him in the hospital after he's off, he couldn't speak. So Frida came in in her handbag, and he's pointing at Frida's handbag. And Ian wondered what was going on, and she, Frida, she comes with a half bottle of whiskey. So Dave put a wee bit on his lips because he couldn't have swallowed. And then he got the syringe and filled it and scooted it up his nose. <laughs> so he, he didn't uh, taste it, but he got the effect of it. Uh, and I mean, the nurse came in and says, if I didn't know better, I would say that you've been drinking, Dave. <laughs> That's I mean, another that, true story. Absolutely, Dave. My wife was night shift um, and he was allowed out in weekend pass. So he returned on the Sunday. Uh, but prior to doing so, on the Friday uh, I was out at the farm and they asked me to get a 50 mil syringe, so which I, I did. I was working in the hospital at the time, um, and Julie arrived back in the ward, absolutely pissed um, on the Sunday evening. My wife gave him a terrible row. However, it was the best night's sleep he'd had post surgery, so she felt a wee bit kind of um, bad that she'd given him a row, but. It worked for both parties. I was going to t tell you a, a story about uh, the Waverley Hotel. So the new market in Perth had opened, and remember you had to to jump in a minibus and get up for the Waverley Hotel. And Dave, you'll be able to maybe correct me if I'm wrong here. It was the night porter's name Frank? Frank Cadger was the barman through the back. Was it no Fred? Through the back. Aye, the guy Fred he, was a night boy. He used to do Fred. Do a guys we... It was Fred. Aye. So um, part of the, the order in the morning, you know, depending on what time you were getting up, there would be a chap at the door and a tray of, you know, there was Buff, Smithy and myself. So six brandy and ports were delivered to the room prior to catching the minibus. So in this particular morning, um, the Sunday morning, they were duly delivered. Uh, Buff didn't want any, so Smithy and I had three each. And... Down, caught the minibus up to the market, did what we had to do, and then Smithy continued on the brandy and ports in the bar. So minibus back down to the Waverley Hotel at approximately, you know, three thirty, four o'clock in the afternoon. I, I need a lie down, he says. So Big Buff and I decided that we would play a, a, a prank on him and left him for a couple of hours. Came running in to the room, Smithy. We've slept in for the morning judging. Well, he got up out of the bed, ran about the room three times, suddenly caught on that we were taking the mic out of him and chased us down the stairs and he's in the, the vest and pants chasing Buff and I down the stairs in the Waverley. I mean, you couldn't write this <laughs> nowadays, you know, but I mean... You wouldn't that get was it on Emmerdale, it would be too far-fetched. Oh, uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> they wouldn't believe you. They wouldn't no. believe you. Uh, well, I mean, as I said at the very start, what a sense of humour the man had, you know. And a, 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 a great a great friend, a great, um, a great teacher, you know. Professor of the University of Life. There we are, that's what he's... <laughs> Brilliant. Well, thank you very much for your time, um, Norman and Dave. That's been fascinating to hear those stories about about Smithy. I'm sure a lot of people will enjoy them. And uh, uh, very kind of you to, to come onto the podcast uh, on Top Lines and Tales. Thanks very much. Thanks very much for having us. No bother, Andy. That was been great fun. Bra, lads. Bra, Dave. Bra, See you, Andy. Bra, Norman. Uh, Cheers, fellas. 
Bye. 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 Bye.